any of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves. This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. Why, hello, guys. It's Boomer Anderson here, your host of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. I want to take the time and say thank you so much for tuning in today. If you continue downloading and subscribing, it keeps me going, keeps me motivated, and it's really cool. Now, just to reiterate the purpose of this podcast, we look at the vast world of health. We go all the way out to the fringes and back to the mainstream. I bring on experts to share the latest research and to separate true from false and to give you bite-sized pieces of actionable information which you can use in your everyday life to become a higher performer or to just be healthier, be a better person, enjoy life. Let's spend a moment on sponsors. Now, I debated for a long time on having sponsors for this podcast. The reason why we do have sponsors or a sponsor per podcast is to fund really the cost of production. There's an editor, there's a hosting agent, and there's a number of other different costs, not to mention time, that go into producing each one of these podcasts. But your support of these sponsors will help me hire things like a researcher. And the point of the researcher is to be able to do more research, to be able to produce more episodes, give you more content and more information, which you can use in your everyday life to become more superhuman. And I would love to see a lot of walking superhumans out there. The one condition I have for all of the sponsors is that I actually use them. And so the sponsor of today's podcast is Butcher Box. Butcher Box is my go-to when it comes to getting meat in the United States. By the time this podcast is published, I will have gone to and probably come back from the United States of America. Now, I'm on my way tomorrow, and I'm a little uncertain about the quality of the food and meat that I'm going to be getting. Produce is one thing, but meat, meat I can get delivered directly to my door through Butcher Box. They have 100% grass-fed, grass-finished beef, organic, free-range chicken, ooh yeah, as well as heritage breed pork, all delivered directly to your door. So if you go to butcherbox.com slash boomer, as in my name, they'll give you $15 off your first order and free bacon. You get free bacon and your first order, $15 off. Free bacon. I said it again. Free bacon. It's raining gold. Enjoy. My guest today, and I'm super excited to announce this, is Wolfgang Unsold. Wolfgang is currently one of the most successful personal trainers and strength coaches in the world. He's the founder of Your Personal Strength Institute, which we'll just go by YPSI going forward, in Stuttgart, Germany. They offer consulting and personal training, the YPSI supplement line, highly recommend the amino acids, as well as seminars and the YPSI trainer certification. Wolfgang is known worldwide for the outstanding results he achieves with his clients. He's published over 100 before and after transformations. If you know anything about the personal training world, that's quite a lot. He's also worked with a wide variety of clients ranging from executives, hello out there, to athletes from over 20 sports, including 13 athletes that participated in the Winter Olympics in 2014 in Sochi, Russia, and three athletes which competed at the Olympic Summer Games in 2016 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The YPSI trainer B and A license has certified over 300 trainers in 24 countries on four continents, and he's given seminars on training and nutrition, which I've attended one of them, in 22 countries worldwide. His book, Dein Bestes Training, Ask the Coach, and Die Perfecte Nieburger, again, please forgive my German, I'm pretty awful at it, are all bestsellers in his first English print book, has been published in October 2017 under the title Advanced Training Tips. And it's available right now on Kindle and Amazon. His books Improve Your Squat, Improve Your Arms, and Strengthen Mass Holiday, which I highly recommend, as well as Training Weekends, have been published throughout 2017, are available on his website, which are in the show notes. The show notes can be found at decodingsuperhuman.com backslash Wolfgang. For more information on Wolfgang, you can go to ypsi.de. You can follow them on Instagram as well as Facebook. I really enjoyed our conversation. We talked a little bit about why Wolfgang recommends drinking salt water and lime to all of his clients first thing in the morning, the common flaws that Wolfgang finds within the fitness industry today, and he has a pretty awesome, interesting way of presenting that, as well as the need for supplements among different high-performing people. I really enjoyed this. I really hope you enjoy it as well. And I look forward to hearing your feedback on my conversation with Wolfgang Unsold. 
please enjoy the episode. Wolfgang, thank you for coming on the show. Boomer, thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, just before we begin, uh, perhaps I'll give an introduction for the audience who may or may not know you. A year ago, a little bit over a year ago, I was moving to Amsterdam and looking for high quality supplements. And one of the sources that I went to was, of course, uh, Charles Poliquin, who referred me to you. And that's how I came across YPSI. And actually, it's funny because we exchanged a few emails. I ended up going to your strength and hypertrophy seminar and enjoying the seminar so much and the content that you delivered that I wanted you to be on the show. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Again, thank you for having me. I'm happy to share. Awesome. Well, before we get started, perhaps for those who know you a little bit less than I do, uh, how did you get into the fitness and nutrition field? And what are some of the success stories that you have? Because I know you're one of the most famous personal trainers in the world. So if you don't mind sharing those with the audience, it'd be perfect. Of course, it's basically two things that got me into becoming a trainer. First, um, starting out strength training. I uh, did not start out strength training in the early days as a, a lot of guys do. I started with strength training fairly, um, fairly late. Um, during university, I was doing a lot of long distance running. Uh, even though these days I don't look like anymore. <laughs> but back, back, back then I was like a meter 85, 70 kilos. I was doing over 100 kilometers a week. I uh, was very enthusiastic about it. Uh, but then I developed shin splints. And this is about uh, 15, 16 years ago. And back then it was like basically put some cream on it and then rest for a month and then go run again. Unfortunately, that didn't work out well. I had multiple breaks and then one time I took a month break, went for a run after 20 minutes, the shins hurt again and I was like, I'm over. That's more or less the last time I was running. And then was looking into a different sport and I have ended up with strength training because one of my um, high school friends uh, was into bodybuilding early. You know, back when we were 16, he was like having six meals a day, doing like the rice cakes and protein shake. And back then I, I found it kind of funny as a lot of people. But he was all, all about it. And then he got me, right, why, did, why don't you start uh, trying out the gym? And I was like, all right, let's, let's see what it is. And I really liked the structured and progressive approach of it. And at the same time, I was uh, studying business here in Germany. And I did four semesters. And after like four semesters, I was kind of like, is this like a, going the direction I like it to go? Is this where I see myself? And I was like, nah. You know? it was like after four semesters, I dropped out. And then uh, I didn't actually know what to do. I was looking for a job where, um, that I couldn't make make a profession rather than an, an obsession. So I've, I've ended up training a lot. I've had a lot of time on my hands, only working like four and a half days a week. And then eventually, um, my girlfriend at the time, which then uh, became my wife, was like, hey, you're so much into strength training. Why don't you start working as a trainer? And at the time, about uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, I was like, can you make a living as a trainer? <laughs> and then I talked to the guys. I would talk to the guys that was working at the gym I trained at. And, uh, they were like, yeah, kind of like, okay. And I was like, okay, at least, um, okay, let's, let's start working as a trainer. And that's basically how I started working. Well, I did um, start working at a gym right away as a trainer, did a few seminars in Germany, attended them. And then early, even though with a little bit of uh, knowledge uh, I had back then, uh, pragmatism told me that they, these guys teaching something, it's not going to get results. It's not getting results. So where do I go where I learn something that actually gets results? So this is how I um, went abroad for the first time, which uh, then started a pretty um, intense seminar and internship journey back in like 2008. And then it basically just, yeah, it went from there, worked at the gym for three and a half years, then, uh, then opened up my own gym, which I have for uh, about seven and a half years now. Alongside, I worked with a lot of clients ranging from like 10-year-old soccer players uh, to 75-year-old enthusiastic um, athletes. And in between, I've had everything from uh, a housewife, uh, a lot of executives, and um, definitely uh, some um, high-performance athletes. About 10% of my clientele is uh, high-level athletes. I've worked with over 10 uh, different, uh, over 20 different sports. I've had 13 guys to compete at the Sochi Winter Olympics. I had three guys that competed at the Rio Summer Olympics. And beyond that, I've had um, you know, first league soccer, first league handball, a lot of fight sports. I've had three kickboxing world champions. I have uh, worked with a bunch of guys that fought in the UFC or fight in the UFC. So I've had a, a wide range of athletes that I work with, but at the same time, a wide range of clients that I work with. One, one thing I always tell clients in the, first, in the first assessment, no matter what specific goals you have, being it 
being more faster, or jumping higher, or rehabbing from an injury. Um, there's always two non-specific goals that I follow, which is number one, more energy, and number two, better sleep. Because independent of what your actual goal is, being a qualifying client for a national team, or scoring more points, or losing 10% body fat, or gaining 10 kilos, or squatting double body weight for the first time in your life, the more energy you have and the better you sleep, the easier it is to achieve that goal. So for me, those two are uh, above everything else, and then we specif specify a bit more depending on what the client specifically wants to achieve. Wow. Uh, so many questions that come out of that. So if I read that correctly, or if I did the math correctly, 16 Olympians, a variety of sports, including the UFC, and just a whole host of a wide range of clients, frankly. So you've experienced it all. Now, uh, one question that came out of there is, where did you do your internship abroad, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I did multiple internships. So I would say that the first one um, that influenced me the most was at Clemson University with the strength coach for men's basketball, Preston Green. Okay. He worked at Clemson at the time. Uh, he was also at Stanford. And right now, he's for like the last five years, he is at uh, Florida. Gainesville, which is one of the best uh, basketball programs in the country. It absolutely is. They rival my University of Kentucky Wildcats <laughs> quite a bit, but that, that's good to hear. Awesome. So going on to just fitness in general, because I, I'm sure you have an opinion on this, given your position in the fitness industry, what do you think is the biggest problem with fitness and strength? Well, I guess just the fitness industry in general right now fitness industry in general lives of hype uh the thing with hype is it lasts only as long as it lasts which is usually not, not very long uh, there's too many people out there especially with social media that have an opinion but an opinion that's not necessarily getting results um, i've recently read a book um by charlie munger called charlie's poor uh, poor charlie's almanac it's one of my favorites one of the stories that was in there uh, was about uh, the so-called chauffeur knowledge. So basically, he tells a story about the, the Mo Mo Nobel Prize winner, Max Planck. About uh, almost 100 years ago, he won a Nobel Prize in qu for quantum physics. Back then, there was no internet, there was no TV. So um, to spread what he has discovered, he did like a little uh, lecture tour throughout Germany. And he had this chauffeur that would drive him around from uh, city to city every day, where he would give a small talk about quantum physics at night. And after a couple of weeks, uh, the chauffeur was like, when they were driving to Munich, he was like, hey, I've, I've listened to you talk, give the same talk so often now. I know it in and out. What do you think? I wear your suit tonight. You wear my suit, wear my chauffeur hat. You sit in the front row and I'm on stage and I'll give the talk. And he was like, yeah, that's a good, good idea. Let's go do that. And then they were in Munich. Um, the chauffeur stood on stage as Max Planck and was giving the identical speech that um, Max Planck was giving for weeks on quantum physics and when um, the speech was over there were from a bunch of questions and the first guy raised his hand and had a question which was fairly technical and then um, the chauffeur standing on stage as Max Planck was basically answered I'm surprised that a progressive city such as Munich um, I get asked such a simple question I would like to hand it over uh, to my chauffeur sitting in the first row which was then uh, Max Planck answering that question which is a, is a funny story but it basically divides between chauffeur knowledge, which is basically knowledge you have acquired from someone else without actually testing it. Whereas real knowledge is knowledge that you acquire, you test it, you apply it, you modify it based on the um, experience you have, ideally successful experience, and then repeat that. Obviously, chauffeur knowledge, you read something, you repeat it. It's a very much, it's an easier and shorter way than actually having to learn something or listen to something, read something that apply, put in the work, put in the time. And actual knowledge takes time. But everyone who is an expert in his field will tell you that it's not a question of months, no matter how much you work, it's a question of years. And even after being an expert in a field for years, you're still gonna make little tweaks to what you actually know based on the experience, which takes time. You know, it's not go online, read articles for 50 hours, and then you start an Instagram channel. You might have the looks, but uh, you're, you're transmitting information that's often flawed. The reason why uh, so little people actually get the results in the gym that they want. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's, uh, it's less than a percent of people that go to gyms that actually get the results they want. And a, a lot of it comes down to 
show for knowledge. So what would be your advice for, let's say, those beginning trainers who have that six-pack abs on Instagram? And would you just tell them to put their head down, get off of Instagram, and go and train some people? Or any, any other tips for them? It's very boring advice. But that's actually how you learn something. You get into the trenches. More or less every real job education, you, get, you go into the trenches. For example, in Germany, the, the job that has the longest time of education is being an, an emergency room surgeon. It takes 12 years to become an emergency room surgeon. You first have to do six years of medical school, and then you have to do another six years of uh, working uh, in, a, in a hospital in the emergency room. The first half year, all you do is you assist on uh, the surgeries. And usually there's two guys that assist and one main surgeon. And the one assistant is usually the guy that's on the other side of the surgery, so he doesn't see anything. So all he has to do for half a year is basically you know, hold hooks and, and uh, assist without actually learning something. That's very boring, but every ER surgeon will go through that. And everyone will tell you at the end, and especially 10, 20 years later, that's been very valuable time spent in the trenches. Becoming a personal trainer, there's not, not a country in the world that actually has a formal education to become one. You know, everybody can become, you're enthusiastic about fitness. One good, good thing about becoming a fitness trainer is everybody becomes a fitness trainer for the same reason. Because they're passionate about training and they want to transmit that passion to other people. It's not very few jobs, you know, you're not, you're not passionate about um, whatever, selling shoes. I thought you were going to say my former profession there for a second. Um, yeah, but there's some people that are, um, that are passionate about banking. So. Oh, of course, of course. So, nonetheless, you know, in, in basically every trainer becomes a trainer because they're passionate about training. But becoming a trainer is not as easy as it seems. You have to be in the trenches. You have to gain technical education from books, seminars, and internships. And at the same time, you have to get practical education, which is being in a gym, working with people, making mistakes, learning from them, and then step-by-step step getting better. You know, even this most simple job you have usually takes two years to get educated in, like a salesperson in a regular store. Very few trainers actually invest that amount of time in educating, getting better at their job. I highly recommend to spend quite a bit of time on technical education through articles, books, seminars, internships, and then on top, technical or theoretical uh, education is worthless unless you apply it. So apply it, spend time in the trenches, see clients, spend a lot of time working. Any technical job is a craft, and the easiest way to get better at a craft is repeat it. There's some jobs that you can pick up fairly fast, but it's the more technical, the more craftsman-like a job is, the more you, can, you have to spend developing that craft. So I'm, I'm all about uh, trainers, get in the trenches, get your hands dirty, work, see clients. The more clients you see, the easier it is to figure out ways to communicate, systems to use, methods to use, and become a better trainer. It's boring advice, but no, this is how trainers did it for the last depending how you want to call it, 50 years. And this is depending, everybody who's really good, who's actually good as a trainer that I know has done it exactly the way. Get your hands dirty, get in the trenches. The first few successes might be luck. Don't be, uh, self-confidence is important, but constantly produce and reproduce results. It will tell you a lot more than getting the first few and then um, having figured it out already, which is never the case. Yeah, and I think one of the the points that you hit on in there, to me, seems to be incredibly important, which is the communication and being able to deliver the information, the knowledge, the tools in order for a person to implement this in their everyday life, right? So to take a person, and I know in the seminar, you use the, the analogy of a continuum to take a person from one side of the continuum to the other, that takes a certain amount of talent. And I imagine just a a massive amount of time learning how to implement that with different types of people. Totally agree. I think actually communication is the most underrated and overlooked part of coaching. When, whenever you work with people, communication is a big, big factor. It, just because if you say one thing, uh, the other person does not understand it the same way. Uh, and then there's different types of communication. So there's different clients and there is um, different types of trainers. So you basically... Uh, different styles of communications. Uh, for efficient communications, you have to match the style. So uh, a coach is going to prefer one way of communication. Still, he has to adapt to his client to make sure the client understands what he actually needs to do. Absolutely. Okay, so going from 
the one side of the continuum, which is the side of the fitness world that you don't necessarily agree with today, to the other side. What most excites you about the fitness world as you see it right now? A steep progression curve. In every business these days, product service or business model cycles are very short. Uh, we have a very steep progression curve. I just recently read a number where it took, it took over 25 years since the commercial availability of the phone until 25% of the population of Western world had a phone. It's over 25 years. It took less than two and a half years for 25% of the population to have a smartphone. And it took less than a year for everybody to um, have uh, internet phoning available. Product cycles and progression curves are so steep, which is the same thing in training. You know, personal training is a very, very young uh, profession. Depending on where you go, who you call the first uh, personal trainer. In sports, it was definitely a guy called Boyd Epley which was in the late 60s, he was the first strength coach for the university. So he was actually the first guy hired to coach strength training on, uh, for a sports organization. So you might go 50 years. What, uh, what organization was he from? Uh, it was a university in the Midwest. I would have to look up which it was. I, I can take a look. Maybe Boyd Apley. He still works at the same, same university. Awesome. Um, he was doing strength training to rehab, and he was actually then getting some American football players, that was the first sport that implemented strength training, that trained with him while they were injured, and they would come back from injury, and they would be faster than before. And the head coach for football was like, okay, what's going on? Why are these guys coming back from injury, and they're better than before? And then Boyd Epley basically told him, like, hey, you do strength training, it makes you faster. And the guy was like, okay, you can work with the team, but if one guy gets injured strength training, uh, we're done, you're out. Uh, he works, still works for the same university. You could call him the first strength coach, coach in organized sports. Uh, so that would be 50 years. Personal training for general population, probably the 90s, depending on who, who or when you get the first person. So it's, it's a very young, young business. And you know, 10 years ago, when, when I became a personal trainer, there was barely anybody who could make a full living uh, being a, not an employee trainer, but a, a freelance personal trainer. When I opened up my gym seven and a half years ago, it was the first personal training gym in Germany that had barbells and dumbbells. Like we had like these yoga gyms and power plate and whatnot, but there was no like strength training personal gym at the time. Uh, at this point now, there's dozens of them. You know, there's over, over two dozen gyms that students of mine have opened just in the last couple of years. So the, the progression curve is very steep, which is always exciting because uh, where is this going to be in five years? How many people are going to have access to better quality training, better quality nutrition and supplementation advice, and then get more results. Because that's the one thing, when I started working at a gym, the one thing that I got frustrated very fast is so little people actually achieving something going to the gym. Now most people just, you know, a little bit for, you know, I did it, and a little bit for I've just moved, but not like, okay, this is the goal I have, I wanna achieve it, how do I achieve it? And then lose body fat, maybe gain some muscle, gain some strength, and improve daily life performance. Very few actually do it, which is very unfortunate, which is one of the things that I set as a standard that you know, in the early days, I, I would have a website which basically was a German translation of not a gym. Whereas when I worked at a gym, it was all about getting that signature under the membership contract. And after that, the member is not coming. But my point was, okay, I want to get people in. I want them to come train and I want them. My focus is on their results and their performance. One um, principle I work and live by is that the results of my clients are directly proportional to my results. So the more successful my clients are, the more successful my job is. Yeah, your business is overall. All right, so I guess if I pull a couple of phrases out of there, and correct me if I'm wrong here, if you're going to give a recipe for success for anybody who's going into any sort of physical fitness training program, goal setting's key, right? Rather than just going through the motions, goal setting and sitting down and saying, you know, hey, I want to get X, X, and X out of this. It's absolutely tantamount. Is that right? Definitely. It's hard to achieve something if you're not sure what you want to achieve. Define what your goal is. It doesn't have to be as specific and goals will change over time. So I'm not the person that's like, this is the exact goal. But you have to set what your general goal is. You want to whatever lose body fat, lose weight, gain strength, or... Uh, improve your sleep, improve your energy, set what the, the general goal is, and then adapt the specific goal over time. That's awesome, Wolfgang. Now, a lot of people listening are in the professional realm. They're 
busy bankers, consultants, lawyers, etc. They're traveling all the time. They're all over the world. Maybe have 15, 30 minutes a day sometimes to work out. No equipment. How do you train people like this? Because you mentioned you work with a lot of executives. What are some of the advice you give them when they're constantly time constrained? So if they travel a lot and the only way to train is um, hotel gym, I'll give them short, easy workouts that they can do in hotel gyms with everything that's usually available in hotel gyms, which is like a pull-up bar, some dumbbells, a bench, maybe a barbell, depending on um, the gym they train at. Usually the, they know where, to, where they go and know what's available. I make them short and easy. I don't make them very training because one thing that's overlooked is that um, training costs energy. If I make you train hard for an hour, and do like deadlifts, 12 sets of them, and you're crushed all day, that's not the purpose of training for the executive. The number one purpose for the executive to feel better. You want to have short workouts that are progressive, meaning that you improve your performance every training session, but at the same time workouts that give you energy. You want to feel better after training. You don't want to feel smashed. So I, I design fairly short workouts um, based around general movements, like from a dumbbell bench press to uh, seated rows to chin-ups and pull-ups, some squats, some lat curls. Uh, to it. allow them to progress from training session to training session, but not deplete themselves. Okay. So if you take that to the extreme and say, I'm in whatever city, have 15 to 30 minutes and zero equipment, do you just recommend doing a handful of compound, compound body movement exercises? Do something. Move. Just move. <laughs> so body weight training is not very progressive in nature. Mm -hmm. So I rather go for the movement factor. So do something. An advice that I like to give is I like pop up one of these 20-minute, uh, 15-minute YouTube bodyweight workouts mm -hmm. and just do something. You know, a structured plan is necessary to get progression. But if you have a plan that barely allows progressive structure, just do something and move. Sweating every day is, is good advice. If you only have those 15, 20 minutes in a hotel room without any equipment, just do something. Whatever, alternate 10 push-ups with 10 air squats. And just to do, do 10 push-ups, stand up, do 10 air squats, do 10 push-ups, something like that to just move. Awesome. If you don't mind, I want to shift over to nutrition because one of the most interesting aspects of the Strength and Height Hypertrophy Seminar to me was some of your, your views and points on nutrition. So there's plenty of diets out there. There's ketogenic, paleo, vegan, intermittent fasting, bulletproof, all of these. Do you have any specific ones that you recommend for clients or do you look at that more as an individual level as a rule i don't, I don't like the word diet because it implies stress uh, from a psychological standpoint uh, when you say diet it's always it limits you and restricting yourself is usually the one thing that you're not allowed to get is one the one thing you'd like to get there's many different diets or forms of uh, nutrition out there uh, i have read only over 200 books in the last the first couple of years i worked in this profession uh, per year. And I was usually about half of them were nutrition book. After like two years, I sat down and was like, I've read so many books on nutrition. And at the point I was just bored by it because usually it goes by the same manner. You have some kind of like catchy, which is usually a name or a food, whatever the sauerkraut diet or um, whatever. Um, I love how you mentioned sauerkraut and you're in Germany, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had that. It was very popular or some catchy title. And then usually a bit of a scientific, somewhat scientific explanation. And the rest, 90% of the diet then evolves around the same thing. Usually it's restriction of calories, then it's eat more vegetables, eat less sugar and refined carbohydrates, and usually taking out the vegan approaches, uh, eat more lean protein. That's 90% of every diet. They're restricting foods. It works, but only as long as you restrict it, uh, which usually does not work most of the time. Uh, eating more vegetables, a very good advice. Eating less uh, sugars and refined carbohydrates, excellent advice. Have more lean protein. Uh, excellent advice. Another thing I would like to add, which is also always part of diets, is regular feedings. So even if you go for some of the, uh, you know, get lean during sleep approaches where you skip dinner or intermittent fasting, which is the way they do it these days, it's just skip breakfast. Mm -hmm. It's not fasting, it's skipping breakfast. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. You know, if, it, if you do the 816, which is uh, popular these days, if you eat for eight hours, you start somewhere at um, 12 to 2, and then you eat till like 8 at night. And basically, you do the math, it's just skipping breakfast. Uh, which I'm actually a fan of. Still, uh, depending on where you come from, depending on where you are in a continuum, it might be better than what you're currently doing. 
So if you come from a cigarette, more coffee with sugar for breakfast, uh, nothing for lunch, some more cigarettes, some, some more coffee, and then whatever, a big meal and a bottle of wine at night, going to intermittent fasting, having lunch, having snacks, having dinner, is definitely a better approach. Then depending on what your goals are and now what the height of your goals is, you need to be more specific. Nutrition often, often gets very dogmatic, which is good in the beginning to get you going, but it's in very few cases sustainable. A, a few rules that I give is the three I just said, eat more vegetables, eat more lean proteins, eat less sugar and refined carbohydrates. It's very simple advice. It's boring again, boring advice, but this is how basically the majority of sustainable diets actually work. Uh, taking out the restriction, you know, eating too much is not good. Eating too little is not good either. You know, just cutting your nutrients is uh, not a good idea, especially because um, low blood sugar is actually one of the main causes of stress. One thing that's overlooked is that stress hormone actually regulates your blood sugar. So if you're not eating, um, you still have to maintain blood sugar, which is actually you secrete cortisol that maintains your blood sugar. That's one reason why some people that are like very hyped and, and very driven, they can go all day without eating. Like they're, I'm not hungry, I don't need to eat. Technically your body needs nutrients, but you produce so much cortisol that your appetite is suppressed and your blood sugar is stabilized to some degree that you can't go without food. That doesn't mean you don't need food. You still need nutrients. Uh, cortisol is a way to manage your blood sugar for survival. The last couple, the last hundred years, survival based on missing nutrition is not, doesn't happen that often. Over the last couple thousand years, yes, scarcity of foods has been around. Uh, that's the, one of the reasons why there's five hormones that elevate blood sugar, but there is only one hormone that lowers blood sugar. Because low blood sugar is much of a bigger problem in general and based on evolution than high blood sugar, which is more or less just a problem of uh, the recent years where we have such a surplus of food in uh, the Western world. To make it very simple, regular feedings, most people should eat less carbohydrates. Some people should eat more. Uh, I differentiate that based on skin folk measurements that I do. Mm -hmm. and then have regular protein feedings, have high quality food, and enjoy food. Food's a good thing. <laughs> it absolutely is. Now, I guess bring, going on the cortisol front, and I, I want to talk a little bit about something that you're very famous for, which is the lime, salt, and water in the morning. Do you mind touching on why you recommend that to most of your clients? Having the lemon or lime water in the morning, it's around for years. Um, I found out that digging into adrenal fatigue, um, which is, has gotten more common in the last 10 years than ever before, and for someone that works a lot, it's definitely maximizing adrenal function, limiting adrenal fatigue is a big thing. I've came across um, adrenal fatigue experts that would recommend a spoon of uh, sea salt and water upon waking to nourish the adrenals. So that's basically just what I did. Uh, actually, the first article I ever wrote was in English, and it was in 2009, and that's actually the centerpiece of the article, was start your day with combining these two. You do the lemon and lime, which is, uh, it does taste acidic. It, it is actually metabolized alkaline, though. At night, you get a bit more acidic because detoxification process is happening in the acidic environment. But in the morning and during the day, you want to be more alkaline because it's easier to produce energy in an alkaline scenario. Everybody that has uh, trained very hard in a lactic acid producing scenario knows that if you produce too much lactic acid, if you get too acidic, your energy production drops and your performance drops. The same thing happens on a smaller scale every second of the day. So during the day, you want to be more acidic, but you want to be more alkaline, less acidic. So in the morning, one thing I like to do is you have the lime juice. Technically, lemon works too. Every citrus fruit technically works. A little bit of that juice, about a tablespoon and a glass of water, and then you add the salt. So it nourishes the adrenal, adrenals, mm -hmm. but technically what it does, if you have low morning energy, your blood pressure is low in the morning. So no matter how your blood pressure is during the day, even if you have high blood pressure during the day, if you don't get going in the morning, your blood pressure is low in the morning. So what the salt actually does is it normalizes the blood sugar due to the sodium. So often doctors say don't eat, consume too much salt because it increases the blood pressure, which is correct. Uh, the one thing is, I don't recommend ex excessive salt use. I don't like put salt on everything. I don't know. Use salt in a, in a normal manner. So salt your food to, to your taste. I recommend an extra quarter teaspoon. So not like a teaspoon or a tablespoon, which clients have done. And then they come back and be like, I can't drink this. It's way too salty. <laughs> like a, a tablespoon salt is, no, it's a quarter teaspoon of salt. Technically, every salt works. Even white salt works. 
I recommend Himalayan salt because it's the easiest available natural salt in Germany. So there's other countries in the world, like uh, in the US, Celtic sea salt, which is a brown, grayish salt from the Britannia in France. It's very easy available. In Turkey, you have blue stone salt. In Hawaii, you have black lava salt. Uh, there's different types of, um, of salt available. I prefer the natural colored salt over the white salt because the color comes from the minerals uh, that are in the salt. For example, Himalayan salt is pinkish uh, because there's some iron in which you know, white, red gives a pinkish color. Um, is salt an um, uh, ideal or a sufficient mineral um, provider? Definitely it's not. It's not enough. Still, it's a little something, and it's a little something with very little further investment. You know, the difference in price between uh, Himalayan salt and white salt is not that great, and the difference in getting Himalayan salt and white salt is not that great. So it's very little effort for quite a good return. So I'm all about uh, investments with big interest. So I think switching from a white salt to a colored salt, my favorite choice is Himalayan salt in Germany, just because of its availability. You can use any other salt you want. Uh, it's excellent advice to improve, normalize blood pressure in the morning, which improves your energy. And at the same time, the salt in combination with the water improves hydration. We all lose about one and a half liter waters uh, during sleep, no matter how hot it is or in the summer or in a, in a warm climate, even more. But losing water, losing hydration actually diminishes power output. This is very well studied in athletics, but at the same time, it diminishes mental performance. Everybody that has been fairly dehydrated in the summer due to sports knows the brain goes slower if you drink too little. You lose a lot of water, you dehydrate at night, so I want to rehydrate very fast. So I have a glass of water, I add the salt, it rehydrates faster. Then we have the salt that nourishes the adrenals and improves morning energy, and then we have, I use the lime juice that improves this acid alkaline balance and improves energy too. So it's a super small investment. It's a glass of water, quarter teaspoon salt, shot of lime juice. It doesn't take any time. It's barely any investment. It's easy to get. And there's nothing that's so small that gives you so much benefit. This is why it's the first thing I recommend all of my clients. I'm big about making small changes with big results. Because making big, big changes with big results, it's a lot easier. But the problem with big changes, they're a lot harder to implement and a lot harder to sustain. Microhabit building drives long-term change, right? That's a term I like. I've never heard of it, actually. Microhabits, yeah. But I'm all about microhabits. I, I, I borrowed the continuum one from you, so I, I hereby give you microhabits in return. Micro and macrohabits. Oh, that's a good one. So my favorite microhabit is starting the day with a glass of water, lime juice, and Himalayan salt because it's so easy and it does so much. Try it out. Uh, some people don't get that much of it. Most people do. I'm a big, you know, pragmatism prevails. Do it for two months. If you felt zero effect, if you didn't measure any effect with like skin fold measurement or anything else like that, uh, just don't keep doing it. Uh, if you feel an effect, and a lot of people do in the first few weeks, uh, even in the first couple of days, keep doing it. It's so simple. Uh, you know, the more simple, uh, the lower the investment, the higher the interest, the more I'm a fan of it. Awesome. So what do you think about cheat days in terms of diets? I, I have to ask, maybe it seems like you'd be warm to it, but I have to ask the question. Again, with the word diet, it's fairly stressful. With the word cheat, uh, it also implies uh, some negative. So what I give my clients is free meals. So it's basically a, a meal where you can have whatever you like. It doesn't mean you have to eat garbage food. No, eat something that makes you feel good. That's the only rule I have. So I don't care if you eat three Ben and Jerry's and you feel good after, no problem. If you eat three Ben and Jerry's and your stomach gives you problems for a couple hours, uh, with maybe one or two Ben and Jerry's too much. <laughs> so the only rule I give is you have to, or the principle I give is you have to feel good after. And you can have regular free meals. Now there's only so many meals you have in a week. Uh, usually if you go by three main meals, there's 21 meals in one week. If uh, 19, 20 are like on point, you're gonna make progress. A free meal is very important for sustainability of a, a change. And also there's, you know, there's social happenings, there's birthdays, you might, you know, you might visit your grandmother and she makes cake or something like that. Follow the plan 95% will lead you to your goal a lot more consistently than follow something 100% for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and then skipping the whole thing, which is what often happens. You know, you, you follow a plan to the T for three to six weeks 
and then you have like one meal just fit the plan and then like ah, i've had that one meal i keep the rest of the day the next day is like ah, yesterday didn't work I'll, I'll go for that weekend and then monday i start again and then you know monday morning like ah, i didn't do the last couple of days that's nah, all over i don't care the cheap month those type of changes very often you know stick to getting the majority of stuff right you know absolutely the majority of meals have to be right to get the majority of results absolutely so why don't we shift over to supplements now when we talk about supplements and i i loved your reaction to the question of should people take supplements when we're in the strength and hypertrophy seminar but i just want for you know the audience's benefit how important is it for people to take supplements and then Secondly, is there a supplement that everybody should be taking or they don't get enough of uh, that you recommend? Different question. How important it is to get your car to the workshop regularly? <laughs> I don't have a car. So in, in Amsterdam, we have bikes. So we have bikes. Actually, similar situation, I guess. Yes, I have to put air in my tires every once in a while. Um, that's a good point. Make sure, make sure I can still get to the gym on time. I, I go by a continuum. Actually, on the left side of the continuum, there's a bike. And the right side of the continuum, there's a rally car. So it's, it's, it's a continuum of vehicles. And the difference of the vehicles is the demand of daily life on the vehicle. So the demand on a bike is fairly low. How often uh, gets, uh, does a bike need to go to workshop? Usually never. If there's a problem with a flat tire, how skilled does the mechanic have to be to change that tire? At least a little bit of practical skills, but no education. How, uh, how expensive uh, is the spare, are the spare parts? A tire is like five euros. Then you have a rally car. How often does the rally car have to go to the workshop? Every single time after it's driven. How well skilled do the mechanics have to be? Number one, you need multiple mechanics, and they have to be the best you can get. And what's the investment for the spare parts? It's fairly high because you need to have the most high quality spare parts because the demand on the car is so high. So we, we all vehicles, based on that continuum and the demand of our daily life determines the uh, demand of mechanics, workshop visits and spare parts. So the higher the demand of your daily life on you, the better you have to function, the better you have your nutrition, which is macronutrients. So it's like the big parts of a car, like the wheels, the outside, the engine and the micronutrients, vitamins, nutrients and minerals, trace minerals, such as the small screws, like um, little tubes and so on that actually make the car work. You need both. You know, if you're missing some, some screws, you might go well. If you're missing 20 screws, you probably should not drive the car anymore. Same thing as with the body. We, only need, we need both new types of nutrients. We need the food. Unfortunately, with the demand of the lives most people have, and at the same time, the type of nutrition that we have that has definitely diminished over the last uh, couple decades, I believe that in the Western world, being optimally supplied with having a demand of daily life without supplementing micronutrients is not possible. If you just, whatever, you move to the mountains of Sardinia or to move to some uh, South Asia, Southeast Asian island, and you grew your food outside, there's rain going down on the food, uh, there's sun, you catch the fish and the animal and so on. It's a completely different environment with a completely different supply of nutrition. Do you need to take supplements there? I don't think so. But if you live in the Western world, especially in the cities, with a fairly high demand of your daily life on you, supplying more and better spare parts, and especially more specifically individual spare parts, to maximize and sustain high performance, big believer in supplements. They're not the base of progress, but they accelerate progress. Base of progress is your lifestyle and your food. A training and supplements accelerate progress. My supplement philosophy is primarily built around base nutrients, such as minerals, vitamins, trace minerals, and some primarily plant extract like algae. I'm a big fan of chlorella. There's only six supplements that every single one of my clients uh, uses, but beyond that, there's over 70 supplements I use depending on specific times with the goal of maximizing progress is it fat loss, energy, um, strength. So I'm a big believer in supplements. If they're used specifically, they accelerate progress uh, quite a bit. But my base philosophy on supplements is built around a base nutrients, vitamins such as vitamin D and K, which is one of the supplements every single one of my client takes independent of the skin flow measuring. Minerals such as magnesium. I'm a big believer in different forms and fairly high dosages of magnesium because uh, magnesium, it does a lot. It's over 300 enzymes magnesium is involved in. 
uh, it, you know, gives you better sleep because magnesium is a raw material for serotonin, which is the neurotransmitter that calms you down at night. And serotonin is raw material for melatonin, which is what puts you to deep sleep. So if you don't have enough magnesium, you can't make enough serotonin. If you don't have enough serotonin, you don't make enough melatonin. So from a nutrient standpoint, you need magnesium to be able to sleep, get into deep sleep. And then we have other uh, trace minerals. Zinc is one example, or uh, plant extracts like algae. Big believer uh, and uh, user of different forms of chlorella. Chlorella is a uh, popular algae. is actually the plant that has the highest concentration of chlorophyll, which is the green coloring, which uh, brings in a lot of benefits, especially from a detox perspective. Everybody who has seen the um, Iron Man movies, Iron Man has a glass of chlorophyll every day. Do not get metal poisoning from his uh, metal implant. Is actually um, correct from a scientific standpoint. Algae binds metals very efficiently. Metals, light metals as aluminum and heavy metals such as mercury, are a fairly strong uh, neurotoxin. And the nervous system is a, is a big centerpiece of my work as the nervous system governs the body, not just from a training perspective. The nervous system is what recruits the muscle. So the muscle itself is dumb. The muscle can't be anything itself. The nervous system governs the muscle, the nervous system tells the muscle to recruit in speed and strength. And then at the same time, of course, the nervous system uh, governs our cognitive performance. Optimizing nervous system status is a big one. I primarily uh, supplement wise, there's only six, six supplements every single one of my clients takes. Uh, a popular one that's uh, popular for a reason in the last decade is vitamin D. As a European, if you live uh, north of Lisbon, there's not enough hours of sun, especially middle and northern European as soon as there's an R in the month, so from September to April, there's no sun. That's a good rule, by the way. I, I need to use that more often because if I look outside right now in Amsterdam and it's probably 4.30 p.m., it's dark. So, yeah, we're definitely not getting enough vitamin D as a, a society. But that's that's good advice, Wolfgang. I guess – Couple, a couple follow-up questions for that. You mentioned a little bit about the nervous system. So I'm curious what you feel about quantified self-metrics like HRV. Uh, how do you feel or, or implement those in your day-to-day -day training practices? Or do you use them at all? I'm a huge believer of quantification if it's uh, applied in practical quantification. So just getting numbers for the sake of numbers it doesn't do much. So just getting more numbers is not getting you more results, getting more out of your numbers, it's getting you more results. So I, uh, skin fold measurement is what I use. I measure 13 skin folds with a caliper that goes by 0.1 millimeter exact, which is the, the number one form of uh, mathematical bookkeeping that, that I do. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of numbers beyond that that you can measure. HRV is one. Uh, measuring H HRV is easier these days than ever before. Uh, still, you have to get the machine. You have to do, um, you have to wear the machine. Uh, depending on what machine you have, it only covers a day. So it's, it's not that practical. It's, it's good for someone who's very interested in, in figuring out how he reacts to something or to certain things. Nervous system-wise, it's a good one. Another one that I've recently seen and is more available than ever is continuous glucose measurement. So you have this little thing you, you put on your arm. It's a small needle. You don't feel it. And it measures the, uh, the glucose reaction. So you have to get a diary where you write down how you feel, what you do, what you eat. And then you have the glucose reading that goes a couple days. And then you could compare how did I react to certain foods, which is um, quite surprising for many as there are some foods, for example, like berries, where you basically have almost no blood sugar reaction to it, despite the carbohydrate content. And then there's other foods, something like whey protein, despite very low carbohydrate content, the blood sugar reaction is so high because of um, the uh, fast digestible amino acids. And another big one is stress. Most people have uh, severe blood sugar fluctuations based on stress, which is another way to, to quantify. Um, wh whatever you like to use, or if you do a ketogenic diet and you have one of those ketone monitors, it's a great thing. Whatever you like to do, the m main thing for me is if you have something, you need to use the numbers and apply the numbers. Just collecting numbers for the sake of collecting, it might be fun for some, but it's actually not getting you better. My primary way of gathering numbers is a skin fold measurement. I do it with every single client. I do it once every three to four weeks. All my athletes, all my general population clients, uh, we measure skin folds every three to four weeks. I measure 13 of them. It takes me less than a minute to measure all of them. Super fast. I get very accurate reading, and I have numbers that I work with all the time. So I have a very good uh, analytical overview over, okay, 
we changed this, this is what happened, or we didn't change anything, but this happened, so why? So I use this as the main form of the quantification of what I do as a personal trainer. Awesome. So I guess that, that's very helpful, Wolfgang. Now, last couple of questions here. Outside of weightlifting, proper nutrition, supplementation, what do you feel that people need most in order to optimize their performance and become more superhuman? Most people need a lot more focus. You know, the greater your goal, the greater the investment has, be, has to be. You know, Gandhi has said, I measure your achievements by what you have uh, given up for it. The, the greater the achievements you want to achieve, uh, the more focus, the more time you need to invest, the more uh, thorough work you need to invest. I'm a big believer of full focus and dedicating yourself to one thing, and especially in the gym, two, two people jump between training systems and training a lot or training not at all instead of making a plan, okay, I'm going to train four times a week for the next 52 weeks instead of I'll go to the gym like every day now and then don't go to the gym all summer type of approach. Focus, set clear goals, and then measure and see if you achieve them. If you don't measure, you know, if you know like you're in Amsterdam, you want to go to Rome, and you're just like, oh, I have to walk this direction, and you start walking, and you don't <laughs> look on your GPS consistently, the odds that you're going to end up in Rome are very, very low. So you know, assess where you are and then reassess your direction. And if you're going to, you know, if you have to take a detour, take a detour because something didn't work, consistently reassess. I'm a big fan of numbers. I like math. For, for me, skin folds is the one thing I use. There's different ways to do. I think skin folds is the most efficient. Check where you are, reassess. Consistently reassess and ensure there is progress. And if there's no progress, change something and get progress again. I know it's simple, but not easy. Awesome. Last question for you, Wolfgang. Where can people find out more about YPSI and you know Wolfgang himself? Where can they find out more about your supplements, et cetera? Simple, social media. Oh, uh, we got Facebook, uh, we got Instagram, and of course we got a website. Uh, you go to www.ypsi.de. So the majority of the website is in German, but if you click on articles, there's a drop-down menu and there's actually um, a bunch of English articles. We also have ypsi-shop.com. This is where you get uh, books, ebooks, and um, supplements. Uh, there's also Amazon. Um, I should stock any day now uh, my new English books. So my first, I have, out, I have three books, print books out in German. The first one just got translated to English. It's called Advanced Training Tips. It's basically a collection of short, simple, and practical uh, tips. It's over 150 of them. Easy to read, short, on point, and easy to implement. Awesome. Hey, Wolfgang, thank you so much for your time. This has been super helpful, and I'm sure people are going to love all the information and how easily or implementable it is. So thank you for taking the time today, and uh, I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. I did. Boomer, thank you for giving me a platform. Happy to be a guest. Awesome. Take care. Hey, now, before you go, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in to this episode with Wolfgang. If you could do me a favor, can you go over to iTunes or whatever your podcast player is, hit subscribe, and continue to download the episode. It really helps with all those algorithms and things out there. But also, if you can give it a rating of five stars and leave a comment, it allows me to see how we're doing here at Decoding Superhuman. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you got a lot out of it. I look forward to hearing from all of you soon. Thank you. Thank you.